Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 edition of Chart Madness. We did this last year in, uh, in March and April and had a blast getting four of us together, taking a bracket of 16 stocks and debating the technical strengths and weaknesses, coming up with a final four and projected champion, looking down the road to later this year and trying to apply the discipline of technical analysis to a, uh, a bracketology-themed uh, discussion. Uh, what I want to do here is introduce our, uh, our three guest experts, along with myself, all picking uh, stocks. I'll, I'll orient you with how we're going to go about this, and then uh, we'll get going uh, on the brackets. I want to welcome on our, uh, our three guest panelists. We have Tom Boley, who's the Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com. Greg Schnell is the Chief Technical Strategist at GregSchnell.com. And then Grayson Rose, our Vice President of Operations uh, here at StockCharts.com. Guys, welcome back to Chart Madness 22. Uh, you survived last year. We did okay. How are we feeling about this year? Narrowly survived, man. <laughs> yeah, I don't. This was I, fun last year, but tough. It was fun. I don't. I was going to say I won't bring up how, who actually did did the best last year, and I'm thinking that's probably because I did not do the best because I probably would have remembered that. Does anyone remember whose bracket actually performed the best last year? Definitely I'm sure it was not fun. me with the PayPal pick. Ooh. It, it had to have been mine. I think it was Tom Boley, who is who is pretty I growthy, I think. But we'll maybe we'll see. Um, it there's definitely no wasn't way, me, though. There's no <laughs> way Boley was right. <laughs> so, folks, you have already gotten a sense of how this discussion will most likely go. We've been goofing off uh, for about thirty minutes before we got started. It should be a lot of fun. Just to share with you what we're uh, what we're going to do. If you go to stockcharts.com/slash/chartmadness. You can see the bracket of 16 stocks that we picked. You can download your own bracket. We'd encourage you to do that. Fill out your own. See how your picks actually compare with what our, uh, our four experts have, uh, have selected. And what we basically did this year was a little different. Last year, we thought a lot about first-round matchups and doing some really cool old versus new economy uh, discussions to see what we find. So we did things like a, uh, you know, a tobacco company versus um, you know, a cannabis company and things like that. This year, we basically went with the top 16 listed stocks in the U.S., the 16 largest uh, names in the S&P 500. We put them in rank order of their market cap and seeded them like a normal, uh, a normal bracket, which is why the 16 stocks has some kind of interesting random matchups like Apple versus Home Depot, but uh, ended up leading to some pretty good, uh, I think, internal debates for each of us. We'll see as we debate uh, each of these matchups uh, where, we're, uh, where we net it out. Greg Schnell, are you ready to get us started? I am. So here's what we're going to do, everyone. We're going to start in the upper left corner. If you, again, go to stockcharts.com slash chartmanage, you can see the bracket. In the upper left, we have Am uh, Apple, Home Depot, United Health Group, UNH, and Meta Platforms, uh, Facebook. We're going to start with the first matchup. And Greg, as you get started here, I'm going to bring up the two uh, names, Apple and Home Depot. What did you pick and why? I expect Home Depot to be the worst performer on the whole thing. And the reason is because I think money goes from home reno to travel. And um, as everybody finally gets out of the house. And so I expect Apple to outperform big time. Um, I was at the Apple store yesterday, $2,000 iPads, $2,000 phones, $5,000 MacBooks. Um, yeah, they're knocking it out of the park and I don't see that slowing down. So, um, so between the two, it's not Home Depot. And it's already Apple obviously jumping today as Home Depot has been uh, selling off. The second matchup is United Health Group and uh, Meta Platforms. What was your take on this matchup? Well, I know health is wealth, but I think um, UNH has been outperforming the S&P um, since September. The scooter ranking is strong. I just think it's too slow moving. And I think Facebook or Meta will overdo, will have a bounce, um, probably up 20%, which is more than the expected move for UNH of 10%. So I'm going with Meta, not because I think it's a better stock, just because I think the bounce is bigger for the timeline we've got. So now we have those four, Apple, Home Depot, United Health, Facebook. Which was your pick out of those four to go in the final four? I went to Apple. Got it. So Apple, the strength, more of a growthy pick out of the first four, but you're seeing that as the best opportunity out of that uh, Northwest bracket. We, uh, and I should make a, a note to everyone that the uh, functionality we're using on stock charts for this is actually called gallery view. The way you bring this up is at the top of stock charts, if you switch it to gallery view, Type in the two tickers, the first ticker, comma, the second ticker, and you can actually do a side-by-side -side analysis. And what I love about this special and this discussion that 
Greg just sort of uh, started for us, is that we're really relating two stocks, one versus another, and just doing that a bunch of different times, reiterating that uh, comparison. This is a process that a lot of stock pickers, a lot of institutional investors do many, many times a day. And I'm thrilled we're getting these guys to, uh, to make these comparisons. Tom Boley, are you ready to, give, uh, to uh, set us up with your first part of the bracket? Yeah, but I, I do want to preface this by saying that, you know, when I do March Madness, I normally submit about 20 pools. <laughs> <laughs> you, we, we kept you to only one this time, all right? This, feet to the fire. Start us through the first two, Apple and Home Depot. What did you see here? Yeah, this was a tough one for me because in just about any situation, I would probably pick Apple. Mm. But in the current environment that we're in, and I'm sure we'll probably talk about this throughout the show. I'm a little worried about Apple and uh, some of the growth stocks uh, and how they might handle a recession, because I believe we're going to have a recession with the Fed committing to a lot of interest rate hikes. I don't think it's going to be anything horrible. I don't think it's going to be any kind of a crash in the market, but I do think the summertime could be a lot of volatility, a lot of back and forth. And I know back in 2018, when we had the trade war, Home Depot actually crushed Apple. Mm. Um, and it doesn't happen very often. Apple is one of those, you know, probably safer growth stock picks. Their, their earnings are pretty reliable. I, I don't really disagree with uh, a lot of the things that uh, Greg was saying. But again, over a six-month period, if we do go through a rough patch here in the market, I, I actually went with Home Depot in this first matchup. Because if you look at that relative strength down there back in 2018, the fourth quarter of 2018, yeah, right there, Dave. Mm. I mean, you can see that Apple really struggled for a while against Home Depot. And I could see something similar to that. Now, it is taking a, a risk because if you look the last five or six years, Apple, for the most part, outperforms Home Depot. So um, this is a little bit of a gamble. Um, and I might have a different answer a week or two from now. But for right now, I'm going to go with Home Depot there. And I should note, In by the way, the while you were talking, Tom, I brought up your, uh, you had a ratio chart, a weekly ratio chart looking at Apple over Home Depot. So this is going higher. Apple was outperforming going down. That means Home Depot outperforming Apple, right? Correct. Yep. Correct. Yeah. And so you can see it doesn't happen often, but if there is a recession ahead, I, I think that both stocks, neither one of them does great, but I think it could be a situation where Home Depot does a little bit better. So I went with Home Depot, but it was a very difficult choice. I, it wasn't an easy one there for me. Second um, matchup second is UNH and FB. Yeah, um, this is more, I, I really like UNH. I like the healthcare providers group overall that's been performing really well. And as you can see at the bottom of that daily view, Dave, uh, your UNH versus Spider, that has been throughout 2022 so far with all the volatility and everything, there's a lot of movement more towards some of the defensive areas of the market. And UNH has actually been a leader in that healthcare providers group. So I really like UNH a lot. And then you look at that Facebook chart, which has just been, I mean, uh, that's a dumpster fire right there. <laughs> and, it, you know, there's no volume on this chart. But anybody, if you looked back at the volume in February, the dollar volume that came into Facebook, taking the number of shares times the, uh, the, the daily volume, it was the highest volume on record daily or, or dollar volume. So I just see a lot of distribution taking place in Facebook. I don't trust the company right now. I think it's probably got some more difficulties ahead. So I went with UNH over Facebook. So out of those first four stocks, which one made it into the final four for you, Tom? Um, just because of the fact it's in healthcare and uh, because it is a leader right now, I went with UNH. Got it. So we have UNH in the, uh, in the final four for you. Grayson Rose, are you ready to get started? Let's do it. All right, so the first one, we've now had a couple takes on this, Apple versus Home Depot. What was your, how did you come out on this one? Pretty interesting matchup, but uh, also a pretty easy one for me. I went with Apple. Um, really, it comes down to the bottom of this chart. It's just the relative strength. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're seeing Apple outperform the S&P 500. I like to, to use uh, Apple or, or whatever the symbol is versus VTI, the, the Vanguard Total Index. That's what I use on my charts for a, a relative ratio. Same story there. You're seeing Apple outperform the total market, and you're seeing the exact opposite out of Home Depot. I mean, there since December, that has just been dramatic underperformance from, from Home Depot on kind of the right side of that screen at the bottom. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this is a chart that's going down versus a chart that is kind of chopping sideways, but still broadly going up. Love the bounce off the 200 day. Love that it's actually kind of breaking that downtrend there right now. Mm. Um, yeah, if we kind of draw that drown downtrend there, it's, it's actually breaking above that. So. This was an easy one for me. The other thing I, I would note about Apple, 
Um, in a in a funny way, I've talked about this on on specials in the past. I don't see Apple as a growth stock. Mm. Um, it is a growth stock. Clearly, there's a growth story there. But in a lot of ways, I think slowly we're seeing some of these technology companies actually become utilities for the modern world. And Apple is the exact the, sort of the picture perfect example of that for me. If your iPhone breaks, you can't live without a phone in the modern age. You're gonna go get a new one. It's it's effectively electricity or water or gas. You gotta keep your your devices going. So in a lot of ways, I actually think that Apple is is kind of a utility for the modern world. Um, we're seeing this, a lot of strength out of utilities right now. Um, I think a lot of people just want to own Apple. So it makes sense that this is going to keep being strong. Grayson, as the token millennial in our group of four, you you represented your uh, demographic <laughs> well by talking up Apple as the new utilities. I love it. The new utilities. Your, your second matchup, UNH versus uh, Meta Platforms. Where'd you come out here? Yeah, same story for me here. I mean, look at the bottom of these charts. Just like Tom was saying, you've got a lot of relative strength coming out of UNH and you've got a ton of relative weakness in, I'm still going to call it Facebook, even though it is meta. Um, you know, I like to buy new highs. I do not like to buy lows. I don't like to uh, to chase bottoms. I totally agree with Greg. There's a lot of potential for a big bounce here in meta. Um, I definitely see that. But ultimately, when I look at these charts, I see a stock in UNH that is broadly outperforming. It's in a strong uptrend overall. And now it's actually been consolidating for the last couple of months, last three months or so starting to break out of that, actually kind of retesting the breakout. So I really like that chart of UNH. This is just a beautiful setup for me. Um, you know, I like buying breakouts. So this is a, a picture perfect example of that one. I think I know where you're headed after you just described UNH, but which of these four made it to the final four for you? So this was a, a little bit easier a couple of days when I was looking at it, <laughs> but actually I like that Apple you know, breaking that downtrend. That's a, a pretty interesting one, but I still had to go with UNH. I like this breakout. I also really, really like the the sector strength coming out of healthcare. That's actually a, a reasonably strong sector right now. And we're not exactly seeing that same sector strength um, in, in Apple. You know, technology has been a, a weaker sector. So I like the sector strength in UNH. That is my pick for the final four. It's fascinating how, I mean, healthcare has been almost like a forgotten sector for a lot of investors who thought so much about kind of yeah. pure growth and then pure value. And healthcare is kind of like in the middle. It's a little of both in some ways. Um, but you're right, yep. some interesting strength. So my bracket, and thank you guys, you, you, you each, I don't, I don't have much to add from a technical perspective because you hit on so many great uh, takes. I love, Tom, how you're talking about the ratio analysis and looking at the two relative to one another. Uh, Grayson, you talked about the relative strength and just the, uh, the, the uh, you know, the, how the two of them are, are performing versus a benchmark. And I pretty much agreed with uh, Grayson and a lot of the first, uh, in, the, in the first two, between the two, Apple and Home Depot, I think, I see a clear outperformer and a clear underperformer, and that certainly could change over the next six months. But at this point, if I'm basing it on the chart, I'd have to say Apple just is a much better setup. And the bottom of the page, I think, tells the story. And uh, and I think, uh, Grayson, your comments about Apple being defense um, is absolutely right. I think there's a speculative side of technology, which is pretty up, underrepresented on a bracket. We have some of the more defensive, some of the more blue chip kind of hideout parts of technology. Apple certainly seems to be that for me. On the second one, I found, uh, I, I think Facebook is just an ugly chart, um, and, and I, I will not, uh, um, it does not warrant a pick in my, uh, in my brain from a technical perspective. I don't think you can justify that, but you can very much justify the uh, emerging strength in UNH. I actually went with Apple coming out of this bracket only because I think the market's going to be choppy. I think we're going to see higher rates, and I think people are going to end up getting more defensive, and I see people rotating to the big uh, tech names like an Apple and, and writing things out uh, at times during this year. I think it'll end up doing pretty well. Let's continue on now to the Southwest bracket, the lower left corner. Tom, I'm gonna ask you to, uh, to get us started this time and I'm gonna bring up the two charts. We're starting with Amazon and Walmart. which is kind of an interesting matchup of two stocks, but two fairly choppy charts. Where did you come out on these two? We were talking about this one earlier, Dave, you know, and when we were kind of prepping for the show mm. and these two are very similar. I mean, you know, we've got a lot of these that you look at, you're know, completely different kinds of charts, different kinds of companies here with uh, Amazon and Walmart. We have two companies that are somewhat comparable and their charts look very comparable. Mm. A lot of chop, a lot of back and forth. 
Um, I like the move that Amazon's making right now, kind of breaking above that February high. Uh, so I think in the short term, it's just showing a little bit of strength. Uh, we'll see whether or not we can get back through that 200-day moving average. That seems to be a little bit of a problem so far, but it's uh, pretty early. Um, when I looked at the long-term relative strength between these two, and I think that's kind of interesting when you think about Amazon and Walmart, because they are in the same kind of space. I mean, that right there, Amazon significantly outperforming Walmart over the past decade. Mm. Um, normally, when you go through these periods of consolidation, that's usually the best it's going to get for Walmart. And so I'm looking at this now thinking the chances are that Amazon is probably going to outperform over the next uh, six months. So uh, for me, it was Amazon. I, I, I think both of them are in kind of a similar situation, but I like the move Amazon's making. I actually think, you know, I gave some consideration to Amazon winning the whole thing, but the, I'd like to see a little bit more strength on it before we go uh, any further. But I did uh, go with Amazon. Amazon first, second matchup is financials versus a name you may have heard of before, Tesla, Tom. Talk us through these yep. two. What did you see? What do they do? What does Tesla do? <laughs> Talk a lot. Um, yeah, this this one was probably one of my easiest ones. Um, mm. I, I'm not a huge fan of the financials, the banks in particular, as we go forward. I mean, financials, even in a good market, financials tend to go along for the ride. I don't really look at them as you know, the type of, of company that's going to win uh, an event like this. That's just my own personal preference. So that's I kind of wrote the banks off. The other thing is we're seeing rates going up here of late, and we're not seeing the financials on a relative basis breaking out to new highs. Mm -hmm. And so that tells me that a lot of this rate action, a lot of the selling that's taking place in the bond market right now relates more to um, the potential of inflation rather than to the strength of the economy. Mm -hmm. And so that is a problem for me with the banks as well. So I... For me, it was pretty easy. I, I think Tesla, I look at Tesla like maybe we would have looked at Apple 10 or 20 years ago. I, I just think it's one of those companies that anytime we see weakness, I think you're going to see a lot of folks rotating back into it. So this was a pretty easy one for me. I ended up going with Tesla. All righty. Um, Greg, uh, let's go to you next. Uh, we have Amazon versus Walmart. What are you seeing here? You know, it um, it's an interesting world where we've we've got uh, both of these stocks sitting right on their 200-day moving average, um, one from below and one from above. But the the big thing for me is Walmart has become weight mart. The chart hasn't gone up for a year. It's basically just grinding sideways. Amazon, what's off the left side of the chart is a doubling, um, and then it's it's consolidated that doubling for a while. So I like. Amazon better. Um, I think it's interesting that we've gone full circle and now there's Amazon stores starting to open um, mm -hmm. after after the way the world has changed. So um, really, the momentum indicators on Amazon are just starting to improve, and on Walmart, they're they're not really going anywhere for me. So I'm I'm a favor. I'm in favor of Amazon on that one, and Walmart. We'll just call it Weight Mart. Okay. <laughs> Second one: JPM versus Tesla. You know, JPM, I think, stands for just printing money. Uh, they The momentum is still negative on the chart, and I don't see this horse leaving the barn anytime soon to kind of take the race here. So I, I actually expect JP Morgan to underperform, not that they aren't a great company and all that kind of stuff. They're just not, they're not in the league of Tesla. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Tesla, the chart is actually really setting up nicely for a big breakout on my weekly PPOs. I'm, I'm quite uh, impressed with, with the chart positioning on Tesla. So um, that downtrend you see on the right, I think as soon as that ends, you'll see Tesla fire up and make another big run. I just don't see um, JP Morgan, the downtrend on the PPO down here on the bottom right. Um, yeah, so both of them are trending lower, but I like that long-term one-year kind of pullback in Tesla. It's bouncing, the PPO bouncing off zero. I expect that chart to go a lot higher. So um, I'm calling tes Tesla and Musk in the mini truck because I've got a monster truck coming up in a little bit. So. And then I should ask you, Greg, which of those four made it in the final four for you? Uh, for the final four, I had Amazon going forward. Got it. And Tom, I missed you and I'm sorry for that. Which of the four made it in the final four for you there for these uh, four stocks? Um, well, I had the two uh, discretionary, Tesla and Amazon. Those are the behemoths of the XLI, yeah. consumer discretionary. I think yeah. they make up about 35% between the two of them. Yeah. 
Um, but I ended up going with Tesla over Amazon. I like both of them. I think eventually they both do really well. I just think over the next six months, uh, I like the way Tesla's performing a little bit better. Yeah, it's funny. It, and it, it's just one of those things about how we did the brackets in order of market cap. Amazon and Tesla, two of the three, and Home Depot's the third. They make up about 50% of the XLY. They're all, two of them are in the same bracket, which is an interesting one. Grayson, let's get your take on, uh, on these four stocks. Amazon versus Walmart, what do you see in there? This is the most fascinating, boring as heck matchup of all time. I mean, these are <laughs> choppy charts doing nothing but going sideways, but it's also so interesting. I love what Greg was pointing out there. We've got both of them sitting right on the 200 day moving average. We've got those 200 day moving averages going straight across the chart. One though coming you know, from the top, one coming from the bottom. Um, we've got both of these underperforming over the last year by almost the same number. I mean, one is what, nine mm -hmm. and one is seven and a half. Yeah. Um, really, really interesting charts, but I have to go with Amazon. Um, I like that we've seen a pickup in relative strength here recently. I like that we're seeing some acceleration there. Um, I also like that this is a chart that's had such a clear consolidation, uh, you know, over the last, uh, really a year, basically. Um, and we've seen a failed breakdown in that, uh, in that range. Now we're seeing it actually, you know, heading back up, uh, maybe going to get above the 200 day. I just think that Amazon is, is stronger. Um, ultimately I don't want to bet against Amazon. And I also, from a technical standpoint, don't want to bet against a chart, uh, that just refuses to break down. So mm. um, that is my my pick here. Uh, over the, the longer term, I think Amazon's just going to be stronger than Walmart. Good one. What about these next two, JPM, Tesla? JPM is really disappointing to me. I mean, the, the promise of this rising rate environment being so great for banks, we're just not seeing that, especially with the big banks. I mean, we're seeing some strength out of smaller cap financials, um, but the the big players in that space just aren't getting it. Um, so JPM, I mean, the fact that this is so far from the 200 day, the 200 day is rolling over. We're seeing the 50 day just clearly going down. I mean, this is not a strong chart. And at the bottom of that chart, we're seeing a lot of underperformance out of JPM. Mm -hmm. Um, Tesla is not that much better. I mean, still a chart that's kind of going sideways, not really that strong, but we are seeing a little bit of a uh, relative strength coming out of that. We are seeing a 200 day moving average that is, you know, over the longer term going up, which is great. Um, I like the, the strength that we're seeing out of Tesla. I think just, this is just a, a more promising chart. Um, and again, JPM to me is just a, a very, very disappointing chart given what we're seeing in the, uh, you know, with the rising rate environment. And out of the four, which was in the final four for you? Amazon was in the final four for me. Yeah. Again, I just don't want to bet against Amazon and I don't want to bet against a, uh, you know, from a technical standpoint a chart that refuses to break down. So that's my uh, final four pick, Amazon. Great take, Grayson. I, so on these four stocks, guys, I, I looked at these two weekly charts and I think I just kind of sighed because the two of these are just, talk about just uneventful, choppy sideways charts that aren't really doing anything. <laughs> it's just, it's not a fascinating matchup to me. But but given that, I mean, I, I picked Amazon out of the two for a lot of the reasons that you guys talked about. I like the the strength that we're getting, um, you know, testing the 200 day, it could be potentially breaking out here and with nice, nice upside to the to the previous highs, which is encouraging. So I was the only one that picked J.P. Morgan out of this uh, out of this round, and um, I shared with some of you guys before we started in my March Madness bracket in my family. I've learned to never pick Ohio State because most of my family takes them to go way too far, and they tend to disappoint early in the, in the tournament. So I take them out early, and I it's 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 served me well. So I assumed, knowing you guys and your well-articulated technical processes, you probably wouldn't pick the banks, and I picked them, uh, basically assuming that if that, that would have to be a change. I think from a pure technical perspective, it's, it's hard to justify it now because these stocks are in downtrends. But if you see higher rates and if they actually do materialize, we're so used to banks underperforming technology. If that would change, I think a lot of us will be underpositioned and underprepared for that, and that's how they can actually probably perform better than we think. So I took JP Morgan actually as my final four uh, stock out of those uh, out of those four names. All right, we get to uh, the second half of the bracket. We're now in the northeast corner. Grayson, we're going to start with you. And we're going uh, we're a familiar comparison now, a uh, big technology name, Microsoft, versus a big uh, financial name, Bank of America. Grayson, what did you see here? I picked Microsoft. Again, I mean, over the long term, I used to say this. Sometimes I'll actually just scroll down to that weekly chart of mm. Microsoft. Is that not the most beautiful thing that you've ever seen? Solid. Yep. That is just the most incredible trend. So I'm not betting against that. 
Um, I think the the same conversation holds what we were saying with Apple. Um, you know, Microsoft in a lot of ways is a defensive play for people, even though it is a technology name, even though it has that growth story to it. There's just a lot of people that want to sit in Microsoft. It's an easy stock to sit in. Um, Bank of America, the the chart is not as bad as JPM. Mm. Um, I do like that it's kind of holding some of these levels. I do like that it's it's back above the 200 day. Um, but ultimately, I just think the uh, the longer term play on Microsoft is stronger. We're seeing broad out performance there. We're not seeing it from uh, from DIC. All right, the next matchup, a healthcare name, JNJ versus NVIDIA, which has been a favorite of some members of this group in previous specials that we've done. Talk through this, uh, this comparison. I love semiconductors, but again, I like to buy breakouts and we're seeing uh, sort of an attempt at a breakout here on John Johnson & Johnson. Um, same story as UNH. I like the, the sector strength coming out of healthcare. Um, we have that. We just don't have that with technology right now. So I like that that's um, you know, a bit of a tailwind there potentially for, for Johnson & Johnson. Um, you know, outperformance there since December. Look down at the bottom of that chart. We're seeing a stock that's outperformed the market. Uh, with NVIDIA, we're seeing a stock that's actually been struggling since mm. December. Now starting to tick up a little bit. We're seeing a little bit of strength coming out of that name. Um, but I do like the uh, the breakout coming out of Johnson & Johnson. So. so then between Microsoft and J&J, &J, which got your pick for the final four? As much as I love that long-term view on Microsoft, I went with Johnson & Johnson. Mm. Again, just because we are seeing that sector strength. Um, I mean, basically the exact same matchup that we had with Apple and UNH on my bracket. Uh, I like the breakout, though. If this can make the breakout, I think that we see a nice run there. If the uh, the strength coming out of healthcare stays, then I think that's a nice tailwind for uh, for Johnson & Johnson. So that's my pick. Two there. healthcare names in the final four, Grayson Rose. I don't I don't I know. know you anymore, but uh, but I'll, I'll take them. There's valid there's valid backing to your comments. Tom Boley, <laughs> uh, take a shot here at Microsoft versus BAC. What did you see? Yeah, this is uh, very similar for me, mm -hmm. um, you know, in looking at Tesla versus JPM. I just think, you know, and I agree with Grayson. I mean, Microsoft's been so strong over the years. Um, you can pretty much count on that move to the upside. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm really concerned about the banks here mm. because, you know, rates, I, I used to audit banks when I was in public accounting. And I know that, you know, when the economy's strengthening and rates are going up because of a strengthening economy, banks can do extremely well. They can really increase that net margin uh, or net interest margin and, and uh, you know, can, can perform very well. But I'm concerned that a lot of the rate increases that we're seeing right now are more inflation related mm. than they are strong economy related. I think we're going to go through a recession. I think that's, you know, if you look back to 1990, when we went through the Persian Gulf War, um, we had a lot of the similar same things happening then that are happening now, rising um, oil prices, you know, the, uh, the, the recession, which I think we're going to have this year, we had back in 1990. Anyway, my point is the banks back then did very poorly, even though the uh, interest rate environment wasn't that bad for them. And so I'm going to stick with Microsoft here. I think Microsoft's the better play and the safer play. All right. Your next matchup is J&J &J, NVIDIA. Where do you see here? Yeah, I think with this one, um, to me, it's more, I, you know, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Grayson said about healthcare versus, you know, the semiconductors. But the problem here that I have with Johnson & Johnson is if you look at it on a relative basis to its peers, to the pharmas, it is actually one of the worst pharmas. Mm -hmm. yep, and point. so I think, if, I think if a different pharma had been picked here, well, not that we picked them because they're based on market caps, but if I was looking at a different pharma, I'd probably have a different answer. Mm -hmm. um, I see J&J &J going up and testing the highs, but we've already seen breakouts in the group. So it's lagging its group, even though it's in, you know outperforming the S&P 500. On the flip side, you've got NVIDIA, which has been part of a weak semiconductor group, but it's actually one of the strongest semiconductor stocks on a relative basis. So I'm going to stick with the relative strength within their industry, and I'm going to go with NVIDIA over Johnson & Johnson. All right, so we've got Microsoft and NVIDIA. Which one got the final four for you? Um, on this one, I ended up going with NVIDIA. Um, and again, it's because of the power that NVIDIA has had for quite some time. You know, if we look at the weekly view and the long-term chart on NVIDIA and just the, the, you know, the constant moving to the upside, um, uh, that to me is kind of outweighing, um, Microsoft. I think it's got more potential. And I think in the short term, if we do have a recession, we might see NVIDIA take a little bit more of a hit because they are maybe more growth oriented, not as defense oriented, you know, that theme that we're talking about here. 
But I think in the end, within six months, I expect NVIDIA is going to outperform. So I went with NVIDIA coming out of this bracket. All righty. Greg Schnell, you are up. We have Microsoft versus BAC. What do you say? Um, I'm with Grayson on the shape of that Microsoft chart, just a yeah. beautiful long-term trend up. Basically, since Satya Nadella got there, this thing has been a machine. Uh, they just bought a $70 billion gaming company, so uh, I just accept, expect them to keep performing. PPO is turning up near zero on the weekly chart, so um, I, I think that's always a nice place to try and pick up Microsoft. So I like that name there. When I look at Bank of America, the PPO is in a slow decline, no big deal, but it's just gently going lower. Perhaps it starts to bounce around zero here, but flat momentum isn't great momentum. I'd say it's an average stock, but it is printing money for Warren Buffett. Um, so I think, you know, it just keeps helping Warren and Warren would probably own Microsoft as well. But um, his friendship with Bill Gates has, is one of the reasons he doesn't. So I pick Microsoft between those two. All right. When I the next matchup, J&J &J, NVIDIA. Yeah, so J and J, um, no real upside for J and J. It was a dollar 168 January 2021. It's 172 now. Um, this stock has literally um, been going sideways for a year. The scale is in one dollar increments on a 170 dollar stock, and you look at Nvidia over there, and the scale's in ten dollar increments. So. J&J &J is just not jiving for me, and Nvidia's got stunning growth up a hundred. A thousand percent in two years. PPO is trying to bounce off zero. I like Nvidia every day compared to J and J. And between the two tech names, which got the nod for you in the final four? Yeah, I went with Nvidia. Got it. All right, so we got a couple picks for Nvidia here. We need to pick the pace up a little bit. Sorry, I'm enjoying this matchup discussion too much. I will quickly say I went with Bank of America, and I, I it, it pains me because I a hundred percent agree with you. And again, knowing you guys and your excellent trend following uh, strategy, I knew you guys would like that. And I went with the opposite to see if I can if I can make a contrarian play in the uh, in the pool here. And then I picked Johnson and Johnson. Actually, I like Nvidia, but I think uh, there's an emerging theme in healthcare that a lot of people have been underappreciating. I like the improving relative strength we've seen from J and J. And I think Tom, you're spot on. A different um, pharma name might have been a better a better option there if I was if I was handpicking the bracket. And I put BAC in the uh, in the final four as well, continuing this potentially irrational move of putting financials further on in the bracket. We're now to the southeast, the final quadrant. We have to go a little more quickly, guys. But Tom, I'm going to start with you. We have uh, Alphabet or Google and Procter and Gamble, so sort of a, a communication services versus a consumer staples name. Where'd you come out here? Yeah, this one, uh, whew, this was a tough one for me because you got the growth, the stellar growth with Google, and I, I generally am going to pick those stocks. But then you've got Procter and Gamble, and I think the the summertime is going to be choppy. I, you know, Google had such a big run, kind of like Amazon did a few years back, and then it went choppy for a while. I think Google's inability to sustain that breakout on their last earnings. And then coming all the way back down to the recent lows mm. tells me we're probably looking at a very choppy uh move or you know next six months for google and so for that reason alone i'm going to go with a you know an upset pick here and i'm going to go with uh, procter and gamble maybe to eke out a victory in the last minute but um not really a big fan uh, of procter and gamble i just think a little upset pick there in the brackets it's the two uh two less ideal options there the second matchup then or the final matchup for this is visa versus Berkshire. Uh, so two essentially financial companies, although very different businesses. Where'd you come out here? Yeah, I really like what's going on in the Berkshire chart. I mean, I don't know how you can look at that as a technician and not be impressed with what Berkshire has been doing in this market environment. And on the other hand, really, ever since the pandemic began, Visa just can't seem to get it going. And so for that reason, it was a pretty easy matchup for me. I, I had to go with Berkshire here. Great take. Uh, Grayson, let's go to you next. We've got uh, Google or Alphabet versus P&G. What do you see here? I picked Google. Um, you know, I think if we do see the sort of defensive bent from, from investors, um, I just don't see it going to staples. I see it going to other sectors. Um, I also do see Google as a bit of that same thing that we're talking about with Microsoft and Apple. People just kind of want to stay in this name. Um, clearly strong. That last earnings report was incredible from them. Just poorly timed because we had growth selling off. We had tech selling off. But I see this actually as a pretty resilient chart, um, you know, given the uh, sort of the pressure that we've seen that whole space in. 
Uh, Google's really strong. So that's my pick. And then, you know, broadly outperforming as well. I like, I like the long term there. All right. Um, Visa and Berkshire. Visa, Visa and Berkshire. I picked Berkshire. This is an incredible trend. We've had a, a breakout there from, from many months of consolidation, ran higher, another kind of mini period of consolidation at the start of 2022. We've broken out from that. A lot of relative strength. I love the chart of Berkshire and Visa is just disappointing. We're seeing some of the other credit card names be quite a lot stronger. American Express in particular has been a lot stronger than Visa. Um, it's it's just kind of chopping sideways and and really in a downtrend, uh, underperforming. So I don't like Visa. Uh, Berkshire's my pick here. And then which of those four Which's- in the final? Yeah, between those two, I went with Berkshire. This is just a beautiful trend. Mm-hmm. I see that continuing. Uh, love the love the chart. Love the uh, the move from the bottom left to the top right. If only all charts were like that, right? right. Greg, finish us off here with first uh, Google sure. and Procter and Gamble. Okay, Alphabet. I think the spin out of some of the research companies is going to be a big uh, help for Google. I like the way Google tried to accelerate for the breakout on earnings and has now pulled back with the rest of tech um, in this kind of 20% pullback for, for the NASDAQ. So I'm expecting the next earnings report to pop this chart out the top. Um, that looks good to me. When I compare it to Procter & Gamble, you know, they they sell you stuff that helps you sleep and the charts sleepy to me it's basically going up it's a two dollar increment on the charts so i'm not very happy with uh, procter and gamble so i would always take alphabet over procter and gamble next then the Looking final match up here yeah so visa um my card gets dinged enough so i keep thinking it should be flying but um i am always surprised that chart hasn't hasn't performed well. I do expect as people come out of their houses more, I I would think Visa would start to participate more. And I had actually thought it was going to do pretty well coming out of the, I'll call it consumer confidence downturn. Um, So I would look to Visa to do better. But Berkshire, I mean, they own Apple, they own Bank of America, they, they've they finally been buying some oil companies. And I think that's the reason for the chart to start taking off on the right-hand side is their position in Oxy and Chevron. Um, they spent another $10 billion in the last week buying oil companies. So I like Berkshire. I think um, all of the good names that we mentioned on the out of this matchup, they own quite a few of them. And I would just <laughs> expect Berkshire to kind of be the monster that, that takes us over. So I called it the monster truck. And then you took Berkshire out of this uh, into the final four. Is that right? I did, yeah. All righty. So uh, my take on these, I, and again, I don't want to add too much to your analysis. You guys obviously are, are pretty solid in terms of how, how you're breaking it down. I went with Alphabet in the first two, and the same reason. I just think it's, it's a chart that hasn't really underperformed. It's actually been relatively stable as other parts of tech have been choppy. And I kind of like that. And I certainly went with Berkshire. And full disclosure, out of all these names, the only individual stock of these that I own in a personal account is Berkshire Hathaway in a retirement account. It's, it's a great long-term chart, and I like the uh, I like the potential there. And I took um, I actually took Alphabet out of those four to go into uh, into the uh, into the final four. That was an awesome review. That was like a technical analysis, comparative technical analysis masterclass. But now we have to finish off our four brackets. Let's go through each of us one by one. Greg, I'd like to start with you. Um, we're going to bring up your bracket animated on the screen. How did you finish it off for us? Give us your, uh, your, your champion for the uh, bracket. Well, so between Apple and Amazon on the left side, I had Apple um, outperforming. The, the buyback is just so big, it's never going down, it seems like. Um, Amazon, I think it's an okay stock, but it just doesn't have the the high price points that Apple does, and Apple seems to be um, able to still generate revenue. And then when I look on the right-hand side, I've got NVIDIA versus Berkshire Hathaway, and I think we're just starting, after a 1,000% move on these energy stocks, we're just starting the early phases of a bull market is what I heard today. But I'm I'm literally going with Berkshire Hathaway to take out NVIDIA because I think the the commodity complex is going to explode higher for the summer. And I'd be looking for Berkshire to take out Apple. Perfect. Let's go to bracket number two. Tom Boley, we'll bring your, uh, your picks up. Talk us through your, uh, the end of your bracket. Yeah, this uh, might be a surprise to some who follow me, but I actually uh, started with uh, UNH over Tesla. Um, and for me, this is more of a market environment type of pick than it is company. Uh, I really like Tesla, and if I had to own any of these 16 companies for the next five or 10 years, Tesla would be my pick of all of them. But over the next six months, I think the market could be choppy. I think we've got a potential recession ahead. 
I think the market's going to still price some of that in. I like the healthcare space as a result of that. Healthcare providers in particular have been very strong. UNH has been one of the leaders in that space. So I just think for the next six months, and especially after the run that Tesla's seen for the last week or so, uh, last couple of weeks, moving from 700 back over 1,000, I think that takes a little bit of the steam away from maybe picking a Tesla at this point. So mm-hmm. I went with UNH to go out uh, over Tesla. And then on the other side, I have uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, over NVIDIA. Um, again, this for me is about the market environment. I love NVIDIA. I think NVIDIA is a great company, similar to Tesla. I just think over the next six months, based on the current market environment, I really like what's going on in the chart. I mean, if you notice, the relative strength that started with Berkshire Hathaway began right at the beginning of the year when all this weakness hit. So it's been handling this market volatility extremely well. As Greg mentioned, you know, they're getting into a lot of different areas of the market that are working right now. And so for that reason, I picked Berkshire Hathaway uh, to beat uh, NVIDIA. And then your final, uh, your champion for the bracket. My champion was tough because I really like both these companies in this environment, but I ended up going with United Health Group. Um, for, uh, again, I think it's the, the group healthcare providers, uh, which I, I think is somewhat immune to a lot of the, the recessionary problems that we could have in the few months ahead. And UNH has been one of the leaders in that space. It's got a great long-term track record. And uh, so I ended up going with UNH. So just so we have you on record, given the option to pick Tesla over a healthcare stock at a semiconductor, you went without, you did not go with Tesla. That's clear, right? I don't. That is clear. Now in my other 19 brackets. (laughs) (laughs) Your Tesla brackets, perhaps we'll call those. Um, I, you're a changed man, uh, Tom, and it's great to hear your, uh, I, I love that comparison of uh, some of those charts. Thank you for that. Grayson, we're bringing your picks up. Talk us through how you got to your uh, champion. So on the left side of my bracket, I had UNH versus Amazon. Um, when I think about these two, you know, I think that Amazon's got a, a really strong future ahead of it. I love that that chart hasn't broken down. You know, we'll see as crazy as it is with the stock split coming up. We'll see what happens. But I ultimately picked UNH over Amazon because it's a strong chart that's working right now. It's setting up for a breakout. Um, It is strength versus the promise of strength. Amazon Mm -hmm. is the promise of strength. UNH is strength right now. So I'm going to go with what's working right now, and that is UNH over Amazon. Um, On the right side of the bracket, it's actually the same story. Uh, I like that Johnson & Johnson chart because it is setting up for a, for a breakout. I like uh, you know some of the, the tailwind of, of the healthcare sector being strong, but ultimately Berkshire is strong right now. It's stronger than Johnson & Johnson. And so I'm going with Berkshire over Johnson & Johnson because it is strong right now. It's in a great uptrend. It's a beautiful chart. And I just, I can't pick anything over that. And your champion for the bracket. And my champion is Berkshire. I do love that UNH chart. But again, I mean, I think that uh, that Berkshire is just in a very, very strong uptrend. I think there is a lot of demand for that stock right now. And the way that they're positioning, like Greg said, I mean, they're in some of these top names that we're talking about, things like Apple, things like uh, Bank of America that are that are working well, and especially with them getting into some energy names that are are obviously working right now. Um, I like that. So I think that Berkshire stays strong, especially over the next three to six months, the time frame that we're kind of talking about here. So Berkshire is my pick. Great, uh, great discussion, guys. Uh, I'll finish off my bracket. So I had, so, so I, I was kind of, I, I started from the bottom. I picked the bracket, and all of a sudden I get to the final four, and I have Apple, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and Alphabet. It was sort of like big tech and financials were my choices, and I almost <laughs> started over. And I was like, you know what? I've committed. I'm going after it, and I know you guys are not going to pick financials. So I picked J.P. Morgan versus Bank of America, with J.P. Morgan winning the whole thing. I. I agree, and Tom, I think your comments were spot on. I think there's a lot of challenges to that thesis, and that is assuming that you finally get financials outperforming to the point where we question the sanity of why they, you know, why did we not see this coming where banks start to do well again? I am betting on an outlier event, but I think that's my, my sole hope of, uh, of having any competition with you guys who are all exceptional uh, technical analysts. We don't have much time left, but I wanted to briefly just ask each of you a quick question. If you could just give me a brief response, that would be fantastic. Greg, uh, you know, when I'm looking at this bracket of 16 stocks, of course, we just we decided to go with 16 of the largest names to give us an interesting mix of things, but no energy, no materials represented, represented on here. And when I think of you and in some of our conversations, we've often talked about, you know, obviously this incredible run that we've seen from, from pretty much every energy stock 
but also a lot of materials like Mosaic and, and Alcoa and others that are just having good runs. If energy was represented in this bracket, would you have put them pretty far or no? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think um, I literally uh, we're just we're millions of barrels a day short. Like it's just literally painful to watch. But um, we're going to go through an energy squeeze like we haven't seen in a long time. So my favorite would be CNQ, which is a Canadian, the largest cap Canadian company. Um, and it's up a thousand percent off the COVID lows, which by the way is two years today. Um, we're recording this on March 23rd. So, um, you know, these energy stocks, I still think they've got lots of room to go. Grayson, uh, when we're looking at this uh, bracket, besides uh, underrepresentation on a number of sectors like utilities and REITs, obviously not in here with the top 16 names, but also no mid caps, no small caps, yep. some of the more speculative stuff. And if the market's going to rip to the upside, you potentially see an improvement in small caps. If, if more small and mids would have been on here, would you think highly of those or you think this is more of a defensive blue chippy kind of market anyways? No, I absolutely. And, and we've actually, even with the weakness that we've been seeing, we've been seeing a lot of interest in mids and smalls. If you look at some of these ratios, compare mid caps to large caps and small caps to large caps, we've actually seen mids and smalls and even the micros uh, outperforming very clearly since the start of February. They've given that back a little bit in the last week as we've seen the market really rush to the upside. Um, but throughout the weakness, we've actually seen a lot more on a relative basis. We've seen a lot of strength out of mids and smalls. So um, I think there are plenty of opportunities in there. And if we if we did a bracket kind of like we had last year where we mix mids and, uh, and smalls in with the large caps, I think we'd see a lot of really strong opportunities coming out of those uh, those names, smaller names, you know, further down the cap tiers. Yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a number of great points there, Grayson. You know, Tom, when I'm thinking of you, I you know, we've talked about Tesla many times on different different shows and, and you've obviously covered just this resilient chart, but it strikes me that we don't really have any other representation. It's sort of the arc names or the emerging technology names, right? Things like, and I don't want to just start randomly name, naming stocks that are down a bunch, but it's like Zoom and Peloton and many others. But there are others that are sort of in that, you know, speculative technology uh, space. If there were more of those, would you, would you put those ahead of any of these charts that we're talking about today? Um, over a longer period of time, yeah. definitely. I mean, those are the types of companies I think that'll do well over time, especially if you have a basket of them as opposed to, you know, putting all your money in one or two. But in this next six month period, I think we still potentially could have that volatility ahead. I think we got a lot to go through with the rate hikes, with the potential recession, how the market's going to react to all that. And by the way, the stock market normally doesn't wait until we start getting new good news before it starts going back up. So, I mean, I think there's the potential that the bottom is in, although I, I still believe we might have one more leg to the downside and the summer could be a little bit rough. So I would say, yes, I am in favor of those stocks. I think that some of them will do extremely well, but it's just the market environment that we're in. I mean, you know, Kathy Wood at, uh, with the ARC funds did extremely well in 2020 when the environment was growth stocks. Yeah. And since then, it's been a rotation out of growth for the probably last 15 months. And it's not just Kathy Wood, but anybody who's really focused on growth is uh, having a more difficult time in the market. I mean, we've got the, the Apples and the Microsofts that have held up a little bit better on a relative basis. But those small cap and mid cap names, anybody who wants to argue about whether we're in a bear market, I'd like to show some of those charts because the majority of the stock market is in a bear market, whether the S&P 500 shows it or not. Um, it's a it's a great take, Tom. I appreciate it. Um, you know, guys, when I'm when we're, we're recording this here, late March 2022, it's been a choppy market and a choppy week among many choppy weeks. But we're in this short term environment where the S and P sold off pretty quickly. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the first couple of weeks of the year, while certain sectors, energy in particular, obviously an outlier, doing doing do very very well. But this certainly feels like uncertain times. I think sometimes, not that this game is ever easy, but sometimes it feels fairly clear of leadership and laggardship, I feel like now you can make cases for a lot of things. How difficult was it to pick these stocks and make these comparisons, given the uncertainty that we're seeing in the broader space? Anyone have a, a thought on that? Yeah, I need 20 brackets. <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to say, with 16 brackets, you could, you could at least have all of them covered in some way. Um, Grayson or Greg, what, what was your, I mean, how, how challenging was this, given yeah. the fact that the yeah. world has changed so much recently? You know, I'll throw this out there. These kinds of choppy environments, when we see a lot of weakness in the market overall, 
in some sense, as an individual stock picker, they should be your favorite times because the strength clearly identifies itself. It's easy to see what's working and it's easy to see what's not working. Um, so in a lot of these names, I and mean, we were clearly seeing outperformance in things like Berkshire Hathaway. So it's not difficult to pick that name because we're seeing the strength there. We can see the chart going up. We can see the relative strength lines going up. We're seeing that coming out of things like UNH too. So um, in some sense, I think actually our job gets a little easier in these choppy environments, um, not because the market itself is easy to trade, but because those individual names that are actually working, they really do float their way to the top. Uh, it's such a great take. And I know from you know having a, a, a career as a technical analyst, I find these are the environments where, I mean, hopefully our, our toolkit is valid at all times, but particularly now when there's a lot of uncertainty, hopefully the value of recognizing relative movements can be, can be, uh, can be pretty valuable to, I think, most investors. You know, Greg, when, uh, you know, what guidance would you give to someone? I, here we're basically demonstrating what I would call comparative analysis, right? We're, we're just comparing stock A to stock B, and you guys all demonstrated different ways of trying to do that. What guidance would you give to someone who's just trying to do that? I mean, how did you really approach this sort of, uh, you know, binary pick of one versus the other? What would you suggest to people? You know, I think the harder part for the backdrop is just, you know, we've already dropped 20%. So is that a meaningful low for three or six months? Or is that just literally a step on the way down? But um, so, so when you go through that, I think that's a harder part. So I'm sitting here at the end of March. I still expect us to have a couple of good quarters of good earnings, even if a recession is going to show up. And, and that's what the bond market's starting to indicate. So mm. the, the recession doesn't show up because the bond market switched. It shows up after, a long time after the bond market switched. So I'm actually expecting higher highs here for a little while. But um, it's a volatile market. You really have to pick your spots. And if the market starts to get weak again, then just try to reduce your position sizes. Yeah. All right, guys, we are at the end of Chart Madness. I offered each of you a sleeper pick, something not on the bracket, that if it had been on the bracket, you probably would have put it in your uh, final four. Tom Boley, what was uh, your sleeper pick and why? Well, I would have gone with Lockheed Martin. Mm. Um, it's one of the larger defense names, um, I think, with the war, um, you know, the Russian-Ukrainian war. I think that that's uh, all of a sudden picked up a lot of these names. And yeah, I mean, looking at that chart right there, you can kind of see over the last couple of years, Lockheed Martin had been going sideways. Mm. And as a result of this war, we've now seen a breakout. And what a lot of folks don't remember, because a lot of us, we have very short term memories, but throughout much of the secular bull market advance, defense stocks led all the mm. way through about 2018 or so. So it's really been just the last three or four years that we've seen more consolidation in the group and a little bit of underperformance. But I think the, uh, the conflict uh, between Russia and Ukraine has actually opened up a, uh, an opportunity here in many of the defense names. And I think Lockheed Martin is one of the best. And you can see in the relative chart down below, uh, you know, kind of what I was talking about for a couple of years, this group was just completely out of kilter. And now uh, in 2022, in this market environment, all of a sudden it's uh, starting to pick up quite a bit and it's outperforming many of its, um, its peers. And I think Lockheed Martin's maybe a $120 billion company. Yeah market cap wise. So it, it wasn't big enough to make our list, but I think that it is a, a stock that, that I would have had not only in my final four, but I probably would have had winning it all. Grayson Rose, what was your sleeper pick and why? Yeah. Um, you know, I actually liked, I think it was Tom who said um, a different pharma would have been of interest. And so I'm going to pick a different pharma instead of J and J um, the chart of, of Eli Lilly, LLY. This is the 22nd, I believe, biggest stock in the S&P 500 by market cap. Um, a beautiful breakout that is, uh, has been moving to the upside. I love the relative strength here, uh, you know, outperforming the S&P 500 there by 21% over the last, uh, what is this, two years. Mm. Um, this is a great chart. It's in a long-term uptrend. It's, uh, it's got a dividend on it. It's breaking out. Lots to love on Eli Lilly, and I think definitely over Johnson & Johnson. This could have been actually a, a pick for me. To go all the way. I might have picked this over uh, over Berkshire if it was there instead of Johnson Johnson. All right, Greg Schnell, I think you let this one leak a little earlier, but which one was it? <laughs> it is C&Q. And, yeah. and the reason I like this stock is it's an oil sands provider. But um, the way the oil sands works is once you build the facility, um, your cost to operate is relatively low, like you don't have high finding costs. So um, I like this because as we're finding more and more difficulty, sorry, as we're getting 
or having more trouble trying to find big reservoirs. This is a big reservoir, and this company's just a machine going higher. The the yields keep uh, turning up. The stocks use the same value as a market cap as as Activision, which just shocked me. But um, here's the Canada's largest energy company as the same value as as a, a gaming company. But anyway, this stock looks like to me it's just got a river going higher for quite a while until until we figure out this energy shortage. I would be disappointed if you didn't drop a Canadian name on us. And thank you, Greg, for uh, for following through with that. I went with a sleeper pick. I picked a solar stock, and I originally was thinking of energy name. I figured that uh, my friend Greg Schnell would probably drop a good energy name on us, uh, and he did not disappoint. I sort of went with um, re- you know, renewable energy or new energy. That, that group, Renewable Energy Equipment, has things like solar stocks, hydrogen names, batteries like Enphase and Plug Power all in there. And it's an interesting group. It's sort of bouncing off potentially support, potentially you know, long-term support over the last year or so. I could see a scenario where... Um, you know, energy rises, but eventually it's renewable energy that starts to emerge a little uh, through through the course of this year. Um, so it's an interesting group to pay attention to. I don't know if I'm convinced from a technical perspective yet, but they're on my watch list. And I think something like FSLR represents some of the potential strength in the uh, solar stocks. Guys, this was a blast. I wish we could do this for for five hours because you guys are really thoughtful. You're you're sharp uh, analysts, and you know you know your stuff very well. And uh, it was a pleasure to have you on this uh, group. We'll do it again maybe uh, in 2023. What do you say? Sounds Love good. <laughs> so Tom Boley, Grayson Rose, Greg Schnell, listen, thank you guys so much. We appreciate your insights, uh, sharing so generously your perspective on uh, on these names. Guys, as a reminder, you can go to stockcharts.com slash chart madness to download your own bracket. Go through some of the process, make those decisions that we sort of uh, portrayed, see where you came out. Which names do you find most valuable? I can tell you a lot about the comparisons, right? The comparative analysis. And I know from my background, uh, you know, analyzing stocks at a large money manager, we did this exercise many, many times a day. Stock A versus B, what makes sense? This is the way I think you've been uh, demonstrated some ways to do that very well. For StockCharts.com, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, stay well. We'll talk to you again soon. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.